11 verses today. Now, again, when I share things, it, experiences, they tend to date me, so I've kind of stopped worrying about the fact that they date me. Um, but when I was a kid, one thing we used to do is you get those old medicine, those prescription bottles back before they had childproof caps. And, you, and me and Ben Franklin used to, uh, <laughs> no, what, ha, what we would do, we, uh, we would put a little baking soda in it, drop some vinegar in it, shake it up, put it down real quick, and see how high you could blast the cap off of it. Now, and what Paul's sharing here today about the gospel, and he's changing gears here, and he's talking about the power of the gospel. And he's saying what takes place when the truth of the gospel is combined with the faith of that person receiving, the change that takes place in a life is incredible. It's explosive. Now, He's begun up to this point as we've gone through this letter over these past months. Um, he dealt with the issues that the Corinthian church was facing and really that the church faces today. There were factions in the church. There was immorality in the church. Or people were suing one another. People were flaunting their liberty in Christ. Some were abusing the Lord's Supper. Some were exercising spiritual gifts inappropriately. And now we come up to this point in our context here. He's bringing it to the point, really refocusing in on what is really important, what really matters. You've had all of these side issues, and he's dealt with them. And, and after this, you know, in the first 11 verses, he's really dealing with the gospel. And then after that, the rest of the chapter, he's dealing with the importance of the resurrection and the necessity of a belief in the resurrection. He's bringing all of this together. But here, right in the midst of it, he shares the importance or the, and the power of the gospel. And first of all, in the first two verses here, we'll see the context of the gospel. As it begins in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Now, the word translated gospel here, it's a common word, means good news. You could be talking about the fact that gas prices went down. You could be talking about the fact that, you know, you had a baby, and for you ladies, that might be good news. Guys, not so much. Uh, but these days, again. Then, but when Paul talks about the gospel, he puts the definite article in front of it. We're not just talking about any good news. We're talking about the good news. The good news that far exceeds any other good news you might hear. And that is the fact that Jesus Christ came, died for your sins on the cross, was buried and rose again from the dead, far exceeds anything else you could imagine. Now, and when we speak of the gospel, we're not just referring to giving information. The content of the gospel can never be separated from the power inherent in the gospel because it is the word of God that brings salvation. In fact, Paul said in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, the Jew first and also for the Greek. When you share the gospel with someone, you're not simply giving them information about how to become a Christian. You know, this is your guideline here. Here you go. 
you are giving them the key to access the power of God to save and transform their lives. That's what you're doing. The way that God has ordained for people to get access to his gospel of salvation is through the simple sharing of the gospel message. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now, in order for the gospel to benefit you, it must be received, as it, Paul also wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The word of God, the gospel, is effective. It's powerful. In spite of all the struggles that the Corinthians had in their flesh, in these various forms, in these different situations, they stood on the truth of the gospel. And Paul, in this sense, had confidence because they did. You know, all of these other issues could be dealt with. All these other issues, you know, it's like, if you're solid, and nobody's perfect, especially when they first become Christians. They don't have all their information, all their facts straight. But if they've known and received the truth, the gospel, they have the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives that's going to conform them into the image of Christ ultimately. And so Paul had uh, this confidence that because, you know, you have the gospel here. With all the lawlessness that we see in the world and the corruption we see even in the church, we need to stand on the truth of the gospel without compromise. Now in verse 2 he said, By which you were saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. It is the hearing and believing of the gospel that saves a person. We're saved by grace, by the grace of God as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. As it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, his poem, if you will. Poema is the word. That workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not by good works, not through good works, but unto good works, which he's created beforehand that you should walk in them. He's got something laid out for you to do. Paul is also describing the necessity of continuing in the faith or abiding in Christ. He didn't see faith as a static thing without the need for a present and a future faith. He just didn't see, he just didn't say, well, you have faith one day, you go forward, you know, you pray the prayer, you come back, and everything, and you got your fire insurance. That's not what Paul believed. That's not the gospel. You see, the kind of faith that saves is not just past, but also present and future. It is incongruous to say that you have placed your faith in Christ and continue to live a life dominated by sin. It's inconsistent. Nor if someone's living a life of sin, no matter what they said they've done in the past, you cannot offer them assurance of salvation. You can't say, hey, everything's cool. Go and be filled or whatever. 
No, you tell them to get their life. They need to get their life right with the Lord. You can't offer them any comfort in that because there is no comfort in a life of sin. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, do you not know that, un, that the unrighteousness, that, I'll get it, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And I like this part. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. You were changed. This, you guys were like this. You were the same. Although these people who were not inheriting the kingdom of God, but you received the gospel. You believed, and you were changed. We can't know the condition of someone's heart, neither should we imagine that we can. But we have to deal with people according to the fruit that we see. And if we see someone obviously uh, living in a self-destructive way, we share, you need to get your life right with God. You need to receive. Now, in verses 3 through 4, we see the content of the gospel. As we read in verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The first thing that Paul makes perfectly clear is that there's nothing subjective about the gospel. It's not you can choose whatever you want to believe. You can't change the conditions of it because of culture or personal feelings. Well, I feel that a God of love won't do that. It doesn't matter what you feel. I don't mean to be short, but the truth is the truth. And saying anything other or saying you believe something that isn't true helps no one, yourself or anyone else. The facts are the facts. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Neither Paul nor the other apostles made this up. In fact, Paul said he received it directly from the Lord. He tells us in Galatians 1, 11 through 12, that those years he spent out in the Arabian desert, he received the gospel, which he shares, which he came back and checked out with the other apostles. And they said, hey, we're all teaching the same thing. That's great. Why? Because they all got it from the Lord. If something is true in the past, as it was then when they originally shared the gospel, it's still true in the present, and it will remain true forever. If it's true, it's not new. Beware of people that come up and say, I have a new teaching. Never been heard in the church before. God's doing a new thing. I've heard that so many times. God's doing a new thing. Great, yeah, God's working all the time, but he didn't, hasn't changed. He's not going to do anything contrary to his word, but the danger is these days you have people for, you know, an emotionalism and, and wanting to get in, you know, not wanting to get flack from the world that are compromising. And... That's not doing anyone any good. You're not doing someone who's living in a life of sin any good by telling them, hey, you're okay. It's like telling someone who's 
an alcoholic, you're fine, just keep drinking and it's good, wonderful. Or anything else like that, a drug addict or anything. You can't give comfort to anybody and you can't compromise the message because it does no one any good when you do. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. We receive the gospel the way it is, and we have no right to deny reality and change it. When you have so-called evangelical preachers get up and say, Love wins, and so as long as you love. And then, to me, there's a lot of questions you haven't answered when you've said that. Well, when you say love wins, first define love. Because, as we've talked about you know, a couple of chapters ago, you know, there's a lot of words for love. Well, we have one in English, and we tend to conflate it with all kinds of things. Yes, love wins. But the love that wins is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the love that wins. And it wins by transforming the heart and the life of those who believe. Now, the gospel is then delivered to others, simply relaying to others the message that we've received. The first statement of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Very simple but profound and powerful statement of absolute truth. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. The Bible tells us that we were all sinners by nature from Adam and also because of the choices that we've made. To be a sinner means that we've missed the mark of God's perfection. As it says in Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect just as your heavenly father, your father in heaven is also perfect. I think well, right away that disqualifies me. But we see here God's standard of righteousness that can't be changed. God is who God is. And I can't change him to fit my desires. But as it says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin... That missing the mark, missing God's perfection is death. But the gift of God, a gift, free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Free gift. Because of his great love for us, Jesus took the penalty for our sin upon himself on the cross so that all we need to do is receive him. As it says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to then he gave the right, the power, the authority to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. How a person gets saved, believing in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. All this was done, as Paul said, according to the scriptures. We have the Old Testament scriptures, Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 52 and 53, Zechariah 12, all speaking of 
the price that Christ would pay on the cross. But the tragedy was for the Jewish people at that time was that they missed it. They missed it. Looking at the second coming of Jesus in the scripture, but not admitting or not recognizing the first coming, the necessity of him coming to atone for our sins. So the conditions for salvation have been set by God and no one can come to God on their own terms. No one can come to God on their own terms. You see, when we're talking about God, we're talking with someone who's perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, can't abide sin because it's so contrary to his nature. And we have people today that don't want to, well, for one reason, one reason they denied the gospel is because they don't want to deal with the fact that they're sinners. They want to admit that they're sinners. I mean, it's not a real comfortable thing to think about, you know? That the fact that you're perishing because of your sin, because of the sin, like we said before, from Adam, that sin of nature that, you know, people aren't sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. Important distinction. It's the nature. It's the nature that we have from Adam. And when we receive Christ, we receive a new nature. That you no longer have to sin. Doesn't mean you're never going to fall, you're never going to have a problem, never going to trip up. But that's why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we can't come to him on our own terms. We can't justify ourselves. But as it says in verse 4, and that, the second point of the gospel, is that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus' death was confirmed by the Roman soldiers who were on the scene in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. His burial was a further confirmation of his death. The burial of Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, also fulfilled the scripture. As it says in Isaiah 53, verse 9, <clears throat> and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now, there have been those who question the death of Christ, which is kind of an amazing thing. There, years ago, there was a, a book uh, called The Passover Plot written by a guy named Hugh Sconfield. And what he pro prosed was what's called the swoon theory, is that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross in spite of the fact that he was hanging on the cross bleeding for hours and that the Romans pierced his, his side with a spear. Uh, but according to Sconfield here, they were then, he was then taken in the tube. Every, everybody thought he was dead. They rolled the stone in front of it. And then he revived because it was cool and more comfortable there in the tomb. And so he revived and he got up and he rolled a one and a half to two ton stone away from the door. Ridiculous, Right? But those are the sort of things that people come up with who deny. And the ultimate reason they want to deny the, his death is that they might also deny his resurrection. And that's what it ultimately gets down to. You see, the truth of the resurrection is absolutely essential to the gospel. It demonstrates 
that his payment for our sins was accepted by the Lord, as you can read in John 16, 8 through 11. It's the receipt for the purchase of our salvation. I love the fact that very often when in Scripture is talking about the, when it's talking about the resurrection, it uses a perfect tense in Greek. Now the word for to rise is agairo in Greek, and they make it a in Paul writing here uses a perfect tense. Now a perfect tense is something that happened in the past that continues to have effect on into the present and even into the future. This is important because it means that the resurrection was an action, again, that was completed in the past, continued to have effect. And as Paul would later say if in verse 17, if Christ hadn't risen from the dead, your faith would be empty. It would still be in your sins. But because he lives, as the scripture says, you will live also. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Then he said, I love it. He gets so personal and pointed. Do you believe this? Now the point here is that because he lives, and as the scripture says as well, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you if you're a believer. And because of that, that same spirit that you, and you think, you know, originally before the resurrection, when you, the scripture talked about power being exercised, you, you know, you'd speak of creation. But afterwards, after the resurrection, when it's talking about power being expressed, it refers to the resurrection. The great, you, know, you think, you know, if you look at the world's theory of Big Bang and they talk about all the energy that was, you know, all condensed in there and then exploded out of there. But just think about it. More power. More energy was exercised at the resurrection than at the creation. And that same power dwells in you. Dwells in you as a believer. Now, <clears throat> that is why we need to stand firm on the resurrection. That's why we can't change that. That is why, if you'll notice, almost every Easter, the news media will come out with some goofy thing trying to disprove the resurrection. Oh, we found the Jesus family tomb. We found an ossuary, which is a bone box with the name Jesus, son of Joseph on it. So it must be Jesus' grave. You know how many people named Joshua? And, you know, it was easily discredited afterwards, but those claims just keep coming along. It's like they're going to sway people. They're going to sway people by these things. I found a bone box with the name Jesus, son of Joseph on it. Two most common names. It's like saying, hey, we found a grave with the name John on it. It must have been Captain John Smith. Makes as much sense, which is no sense at all. Now, the important thing to realize, as Paul said here, as he'll say later in verse 17, that if Christ has not risen from the dead, your faith 
is empty and you're still in your sins. The belief in the resurrection is necessary for salvation. And that's why, you know, that's why we need to stick with the scripture and not, and not just listen to uh, modern progressive preachers who will say things like, well, it's not necessary to believe in the virgin birth. It's not necessary. You know, you can still be a Christian, be a good person and not believe in the resurrection. Oh, you can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. Because as, as he said, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that Christ rose from the dead, you're still in your sins. You ha it hasn't been atoned for. It hasn't been applied to your life. Now, in verses 5 through 11, we see what I've called the corroboration of the gospel or the witnesses that came along after this. As it says in <clears throat> verses 5 through 7, and that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Though no one individually saw and actually saw the resurrection, many saw Jesus afterwards. According to the law in Deuteronomy 17, 6, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a fact would be established. Jesus appeared, first of all, to Peter individually. And you might ask, well, well didn't he appear to the women first? Absolutely. But, you know, we're dealing with Corinthians here. And in the Roman culture, you would, they wouldn't generally accept the testimony of a woman as evidence. And that's what's so incredible that it's clearly laid out in the Gospels, but here why Paul is not saying that, first of all, to the Corinthians. But he's saying that Peter saw Christ individually, probably to comfort and restore him. In Luke 24, 34, it's mentioned that he saw him. He then appeared to the 12 when they were locked up in the room for fear of the Jews. That's recorded in Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. Then Paul also speaks of 500 brethren, generic term brethren means brothers and sisters, who were witnesses to the resurrection at one time. Now, we're not given the details of when this was, exactly when all these people gathered together uh, saw Jesus, but it might be suggested in Matthew 28, 10, and also in verses 16 and 17. Now, some of these people, he says, were still alive, so he's saying... Guys, if you want some witnesses, if you Corinthians really want some witnesses, go and talk to these people. They're still around. They'll tell you. They'll say, yes, we saw Jesus standing there with um, nail prints in his hands. Hole in his side. He was there. And we saw him. And then he says, that he was seen by Jesus' half-brother James, who didn't believe during, Jerry, during Jesus' earthly ministry. This is an incredible thing to me. Think about it. You remember uh, different occasions in the ministry of Jesus when his mother and his brother came to the house where Jesus was teaching and they wanted to get him and take him home because they thought he was going over the deep end. He was preaching all of the time. It's kind of like today when people say, you're all about Jesus. You're talking about Jesus all the time. Well, Jesus was talking about Jesus all of the time too then, and they gave him a hard time. But they wanted to take him, they wanted to take him, 
you know, we'll get you help, you know, that sort of thing. And that's when Jesus was told, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he says, who are my mother and my brothers? But those who hear the word of God and receive it. Also in John chapter 7, we read about how, you know, the feast was taking place in Jerusalem. Jesus wasn't going up to it right away. His brothers were saying, Jesus, you really ought to go up there. If you really want to be famous, you need to get your name out there. You need to go up to Jerusalem. And he told them, my time has not yet come. But the comment that's there with that verse says, for even his brothers weren't believing in him. So James, up to the point of the resurrection, his very own half-brother didn't believe in Jesus. But can you imagine when he appeared to him this time? Can you imagine all the confusion that took place? Remember that, you know, the crucifixion and all of the anguish that his followers were experiencing after the crucifixion. And then these rumors start going around. And then Jesus, and here's, here's James thinking, you know, I haven't believed any of this stuff at all. Then Jesus shows up. Shows him his hands, his feet, his side. Can you imagine what that did to him? Can you imagine the transformation that took place in his life because of that? And when you think about it, the way James was ultimately, the way he ultimately died, the Jewish people, Jewish leaders threw him off the pinnacle of the temple. You know, if you go to Jerusalem and you go to the southern, just off from the southern steps, you can see where all of these rocks were thrown down from when the temple was destroyed by Titus in 70 AD. Well, that's the area where they threw him off. And he didn't die. So then they beat him to death. He experienced all of that willingly because he knew his risen Lord. He knew his risen Lord because knowing again that because he lived, no matter what anybody did to him, he would live also. He would live also. Then, Paul references all the apostles seeing the resurrected Christ. Here possibly, this possibly means that this was time when all the apostles were together because he mentioned the, the 12 earlier. Now, there's not, the scripture doesn't always use exact terms, <clears throat> but uses kind of like categories. Because when you think about it, when it said he was seen by the 12, well, Judas was, already dead, so there were 11. So those 11 were the 12. You see, that's just kind of a title that was being used here. And then in this way, you know, it now refers to the apostles here generally as a group, the apostles seeing Christ as well together. Now there's plenty of evidence for the resurrection, if anyone would desire to look into it. I love it the repeated times that people have been challenged to disprove the resurrection and they end up becoming believers. You have people like Josh McDowell, who is a lawyer, um, Lee Strobel, um, someone less well known to the, today, Simon Greenleaf. He was a lawyer. And there's the Simon Greenleaf School of Law that he founded as well, all challenged to disprove the truth of the resurrection. 
and they all became believers because of it. Good tack to take. When somebody says, well, I don't believe the resurrection. Well, not, right, not. You know, just say, well, doesn't make sense to me. Well, go disprove it historically. Disprove it. I dare you. That always gets them, especially if they're guys. I dare you. Now, in verses 8 through 10 we read, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. The final person who saw the resurrection of Christ or the resurrected Christ was Paul. Being a witness of the resurrection was a requirement for being an apostle, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 9.1. So when you have people today claiming to be apostles, um, they're claiming to have authority they don't have. What he says here is he was born out of due season in that he met Jesus later. All the other guys were apostles before him. In fact, they had three years with Jesus before that and kind of moved in the kind of, you know, after the resurrection, they moved into being apostles. Here's Paul. You know, he's out persecuting the church. Jesus confronts him on the Damascus Road. He experiences conversion. He changed it. He's changed there. Then called to be an apostle. Out of due time. Not when it would seem to be the right time. But then. And he didn't use his title to elevate himself. But had a realistic view of himself. As he says here, you know, I was, even if we all, if any of us looked at ourselves, honestly, we'd say, I don't have a right for anything. Right to receive anything from the Lord. The right, first of all, for salvation, which of course is by grace. But it's, the, the same thing is true for every aspect of the Christian life. You know, we don't deserve any of it. I don't deserve to be able to stand up here and share God's word. I don't. There's nothing in me that qualifies me. Oh, you went to school. That doesn't qualify you. That puts more stuff in your head. But it doesn't automatically qualify you to share God's word. What qualifies me, what qualifies Paul, what qualifies anybody for, and everybody who's a believer for the ministry that God gives them is simply the grace of God. As he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am the experiences that I've had in my life that shaped me the way I am and the calling that God's placed on my life in your lives as well by his grace. So it's just simply a response. What I do is simply a response to what he's done. The cool thing about that is if God can use a guy like Paul, he can use anybody. If God can use somebody like a Chris Jennings, he can use anybody. And you should never think that because you were this in the past or because of this, God can't use you. When the only basis of God using you is his grace. So you're, so when you feel like the Lord's laying something on your heart, something to do, which seems beyond you, our response should be, why not? 
It's not because of me that he would do it in the first place. Because of him. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As long as he's calling me to do it, I can do it. This is why, and why it's important that we realize that it's carnal and silly to compare ministers and ministries. It's all about what God's doing, not about who people are. Now, in verse 11, we read, Therefore, whether it was I or they, referring to the other apostles, so we preach, and so you believed. It was the grace of God in operation, in the operation of the lives of Paul and the other apostles that caused them to continue preaching. Imagine all that they went through. And they kept preaching. Every one of them, except John, dying a martyr's death. Every one. But still, as I mentioned, James, every one of them died a martyr's death except John. But we're glad to do it. As Paul said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. They had this compulsion. Because of what Jesus did, how could I do anything else? How could I do anything else? And the same grace caused the Corinthians to believe and was still in operation in their lives and still in operation in your life. If you've received the grace of God, the grace of God isn't just for salvation. I need the grace of God every day, every moment, every second, every millisecond, every twinkling of the eye. I need the grace of God. Because nothing lasts and nothing is done apart from the grace of God. Because it's all him working. It's all him working. And all we do is respond. And the cool thing about it is when you see the grace of God in operation in your life, there's nothing like it. That he would use you to do anything. As I've shared before, the first time I preached a sermon in a, in a church, um, it was a ripoff of a Chuck Smith sermon from Galatians chapter 5. And most of the church that I was teaching at, most of the people, older people, they were very deadpan. It's like, I dare you to teach me something. But there was one young woman up front. You could see, you could see the Lord ministering to her. She was responding to the word. You could tell by the expressions on her face. And I thought, whoa, this is it. It's like I was hooked from then on that the fact that the fact that God could, by his grace could actually use me to make a difference in the lives of other other people through the word of God. That's why I do what I do. It's just the fact that the desire, the heart to see God at work in people's lives. And that really should be all of our hearts to see the grace of God at work in the lives of other people. So have you experienced the grace of God through the message of the gospel? Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Are you seeing God work in and through your life because of his grace? Don't receive the grace of God in vain, as Paul said, not allowing it to 
find its fulfillment in your life. But allow him to do everything in your life that he desires to do. To go for it. Just to go for it. I mean, we should wake up in the morning with that anticipation, that excitement. You know, Lord, what do you want to do today? What do you want to do today? What's your plan for today, Lord? What do you want to use me for today, Lord? There is no other life that can compare to that. Nothing else. You know, you, we recently, a couple of weeks ago, went to the Kennedy Space Center, and you think about the astronauts. Oh, look at what they did. Go to the moon, go, to back, go back. Hey, they got nothing. We got eternity. We can go anywhere in the universe. And well. But to have the privilege of being children of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and allowing his power to transform our lives. What an incredible thing. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And not just that it's information, but by your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, it works mightily in those who believe. Lord, we trust you. And Lord, I just want to pray if there's anyone here who hasn't yet accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, as we've laid out the gospel here, Lord, they see how they can take advantage, avail themselves of the power of the gospel. That Christ died for their sins, according to the gospel, was buried and rose again. And if you believe, you have everlasting life. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that, you know, we can live the Christian life with power and purpose by your grace. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.